Hebrews 9, verse 11 through chapter 10, verse 18. Hear now the word of the Lord as he speaks. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must first be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive." Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own, for then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin By the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, they would not have ceased to be offered, since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. 
And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them, after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. This is God's holy and inspired word. Thanks be to him. When I was in seminary, I had a professor who studied Hebrews a lot. He wrote articles on it. I think he's working on a commentary on Hebrews right now. And he used to say this about Hebrews. By the way, he and other New Testament scholars all agree that this isn't just an epistle, which is a letter that's read aloud to a congregation. It's not just an epistle. It is that, but it's actually a sermon, an entire sermon. And so with respect to this sermon, he said that the point of the sermon to the Hebrews, it can be summed up in three words. Jesus is better. Jesus is better. You see, the author was preaching to a group of Christians who continually were tempted to go back to the old covenant, to the temple sacrifices. And Hebrews is is explaining all the reasons why you shouldn't do that. All the reasons why Jesus is better. If Jesus is the fulfillment of everything in the old, then how could he not be better? Jesus is better. For example, chapter 1, Jesus is better than the angels. Chapter 2, Jesus is better than Moses. Chapter 4, Jesus is better than Joshua. Chapter 5, Jesus is better than the old covenant priesthood. Chapter 6, Jesus is better than Abraham. Chapter 7, Jesus is better than the Levites. Chapter 8, Jesus' covenant that he mediates is better than the old covenant. Chapter 9, Jesus' blood is better than the blood offered on the Day of Atonement and throughout the year at the temple. Chapter 10, Jesus' atonement is once and for all, and therefore it's better than the Day of Atonement. Chapter 11, Everything in the Old Testament, all of the saints were actually looking forward to Jesus. And then it's in chapter 12 that he says, do I need to go on? Jesus is better. And that brings us to the point of our sermon this evening. The point of our sermon this evening is this. The ordinances of the new administration of the covenant of grace are better than the old because the, meet, the, the, the covenant that Jesus mediates is better. Now that's kind of complicated. I'll say it again. The ordinances of the new administration of the covenant of grace are better because the covenant that Jesus mediates is better. Now that's still complicated. I've said it twice and I still don't even know what I just said. So let's sum it up like this. The point of the sermon is... Jesus is better. I want you to remember that. Jesus is better. There's your thesis. There's your purpose. Now, the three points are these. We're going to summarize the one covenant of grace offered to all. Then we will consider the new administration of the covenant of grace. And then we'll conclude by looking at the ordinances of the new administration. Again, Jesus is better. We're going to look at the one covenant of grace the new administration of the covenant of grace, and the ordinances of the new administration. So let's begin by looking at the one covenant of grace. Now this is going to be a summary, but it's helpful. Context-wise, it's very helpful. Now, in the Garden of Eden, there was only one way of salvation. And that was through obedience to the law of God. Do the works of the law and you will be saved. You will receive eternal life. In the garden, the way of salvation was through obedience to the law. Outside of the garden, after the fall, there's still only one way of salvation. 
But it's not through our obedience to the law. It's by grace, through faith, in the one who has been promised since Genesis 3.15. The one who will crush the head of the serpent. From that very first gospel promise in Genesis 3.15, the people of God have always been saved by grace, through faith, in Christ. Always. It's called the one covenant of grace. But in previous administrations of the covenant of grace, under the previous administrations, it looked different. The covenant has always looked different through different administrations. For example, from Adam to Noah, it looked like believing in the promise of the offspring and being covered by the skins of the animals through the shedding of their blood. That offspring promised was Christ. The sacrifice that the shedding of blood pointed to was Christ's sacrifice. In the days of Noah, it looked like getting into the ark and being protected from the flood of destruction. Christ was the ark. Salvation is only in Christ. In the time of Abraham, it looked like hearing the promises of God. I will give you an offspring. I will give you numerous offspring. I will give you the land. Circumcise the flesh of your foreskins. Christ is the one through whom we all become offspring of Abraham, the father of all believers. Christ is the one who gives us the true promised land. Christ is the one who was circumcised for us on the cross. During the time of Moses, when the law was given at Sinai, the covenant was administered through the Passover lamb, the day of atonement, the priesthood, the temple, all of the rites and sacrifices. Christ was the true Passover lamb. Christ is the new and better Moses. Christ is the great high priest. Christ's atonement on the cross is the true day of atonement. Christ is the unblemished lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, who fulfills the Ten Commandments. During the time of King David, the Lord promised to raise up an offspring through David, who would sit on the throne forever and build a house, the true temple for the name of the Lord. Christ is the son of David who sits on that eternal throne. Christ is building the temple right now through the people of God. What's the point? The point is, even though all of those administrations of the covenant of grace looked very different outwardly, guess who the substance of the covenant was? Christ. The substance of the covenant, the one being exhibited in all of those types and shadows and promises, has always been Christ. He's always been the substance. You know, it's really helpful to understand these things so that when we read the Old Testament, we don't turn it into be like David, be like Moses, be like so and so. Because that's not the point of the Old Testament. The point of the Old Testament is the saints of old were being built up in the faith through the promises, prophecies, types, shadows, and sacrifices of the Old Testament. The covenant of grace. It's always looked different, but the substance has always been Christ. It's really important to remember that because the point of the Old Testament is never be like David. David was not the greatest guy in the world. I don't know if you knew that or not. The point of the Old Testament is not, let's see if we can find how similar Israel is to the United States of America. That's not the point of the Old Testament. The point of the Old Testament is not, how does it make me feel? The point is Christ. Christ has always been the substance. It's important for us to know that so that we don't end up like the disciples walking along the road to Emmaus when Christ said, you foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. When looking at the Old Testament, we need to understand the point of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ. In addition to all of those different administrations, there's one more in the Old Covenant. Excuse me, the Old Testament. There's one more covenant spoken of in the Old Testament. What is it? What is this new covenant called? 
Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. The new covenant is called the new covenant. It's not going to be like the covenant that I made with their fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God. And they will be my people. Ever heard that promise before? And I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Does that sound familiar? Hebrews 10. Hebrews 9. What's this new covenant called? The new covenant. And so that brings us to our consideration of the new administration of the covenant of grace. Let me say this about the new covenant administration. It is so much better. So much better. Christians have been doing this for 2,000 years now. And trust me, it's so much better than the Old Covenant administration. I mean, you heard Leviticus 16, didn't you? Can you imagine? Can you imagine having to go through that? That's a lot of stuff. So why is the new administration, the one that we're currently living under, better? Just think about how difficult it would have been to live under only shadows under only types. You're always waiting for that far-off promise of a redeemer who will crush the head of the serpent. You're always having to watch these animals being ripped apart, sacrificed, blood spilling everywhere. That's all you get. You're always having to jump in a boat so that you don't die. Think about living under the law given at Sinai. That day of atonement reading, you would have been doing that every single year, and you would have had to Go through this entire process, and every time you sin, think about this, every time you sin throughout the year, there's another lamb, there's another goat, there's another bull, there's another turtle dove, there's another pigeon. And even when you don't sin, you still have to offer your grain offerings, you have to follow the dietary laws, no bacon, no shrimp, no bacon-wrapped shrimp, right? That's the good one. The festival calendar that you always have to follow If you picked up sticks on the Sabbath, they'd stone you to death. Man, so many laws. And you know what? The heaviness, the oppressiveness of that law, it was intentional. The purpose of all those laws and regulations, especially with respect to the temple, was a constant reminder of how sinful the people were. It was a constant reminder that the only way to dwell in the midst of a holy God was to constantly offer sacrifices. That's the point. How can a sinful people dwell in the midst of a holy God? Bring me a lamb, bring me a goat, bring me a bull, bring me your grain offerings, follow the laws, follow the rules. He's picking up sticks, boom, he's dead. It's a lot of stuff. It was so that people would understand the cost of their sin. What is the wages of sin? It was so that they would understand God's holiness. It was hopefully so that they would understand what it takes for a sinful people to dwell in the midst of a holy God. Ultimately, the laws and regulations, the ceremonies, all of these things were to prepare the people for Christ. So that they would wrap their minds when he finally came around the fact that Jesus is better. What about all these laws? Don't we have to still follow them? No, Jesus fulfilled it. What about the sacrifice and and the sin offering? Jesus fulfilled it. What about circumcision? Jesus fulfilled it. Well, we're not supposed to eat bacon. Jesus said we can. What about the blood of the lamb? Jesus. What about the annual day of atonement? The cross of Jesus. What about the priesthood? What about the temple? What about the Levites? What about Moses? What about Abraham? What about the curtain? What about the holy place? Jesus is better. And in this new administration, not only are there less rules and regulations, but it's for everyone. From our confession, although the new covenant is administered with less outward glory, less outward glory, More simplicity. 
The things that we have in this administration, listen, are shown forth with more power, more efficacy, and to all the nations, Jews and Gentiles. Reminds us of what Paul says in Ephesians 2.11. Therefore, remember that you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision, by what is called the circumcision. In other words, we have the Jews over here and they're circumcised and they look down upon you because you're uncircumcised. Okay? So therefore, you Gentiles in the flesh, remember that you were at that time, what time? Before Christ came. You were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world. In other words, Gentiles were separated from Christ in the Old Testament. Gentiles weren't saved. But now in Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, and he has made us both one, Jew and Gentile, by breaking down the wall of hostility by his flesh and he has thus abolished the law of commandments expressed in all of these ordinances remember leviticus 16 put the blood right there stand over there moses had to throw it like this he had to put it over under there bring me the bull at this particular time otherwise it doesn't count you better wash yourself before you put them on and when you put them off and then that guy better do it right with the goat i mean let's there's a lot of stuff this is a lot of stuff Jesus got rid of it all, all of it, so that he would reconcile Jew and Gentile to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing that hostility, the blood of the cross. The blood of the new administration has brought us into one people of God, one people. This is for Jew and Gentile alike. The new covenant administration is for Jew and Gentile alike. That's why Hebrews writes that that, that sermon. Stop looking back there. Look to Jesus. I know you like the smells and the bells. Look to Jesus. He's better. Final consideration tonight. What are the ordinances? What are the ordinances of the new administration? First, what's an ordinance? Just think of it as a rule. What are the rules that we are given by Christ in the new covenant? What must we do? What must we follow? What are the ordinances of the new administration of the covenant of grace? What are the things, beloved, that we ought to be doing when we gather here together? How is the new covenant administered now that Christ has come? You'll never guess. Word, sacrament, prayer. It's true. I didn't make it up. Shorter Catechism, question 88. This is my life verse. It's not, a, it's not a verse. This is my favorite catechism question. What are the outward and ordinary means whereby Christ communicateth to us, that means gives us the benefits of redemption? How do we receive the benefits of Christ's life, death, resurrection? Answer. The outward and ordinary means whereby Christ gives us the benefits of redemption are his ordinances, namely the word, sacraments, and prayer, all of which are made effectual to the elect for salvation. Are you surprised to hear that the new covenant is administered by the ordinances that Christ gave us? Specifically, word, sacrament, and prayer. Does that surprise surprise you? It's true. It's not through various forms of entertainment. It's not through continual sacrificing. It's not through an earthly priest or bishop. The work of Christ becomes effectual for our salvation. We are redeemed by Christ through the ordinances that he has given us. Word, 
sacrament prayer. This is what we confessed a few minutes ago. When Christ the substance, man, what a, what a name. Christ the substance. That's pretty legit. He's the substance of all of the promises, the covenant. Awesome. When Christ the substance was exhibited on display in his incarnation, in his life, the ordinances in which this new covenant are dispensed are the preaching of the word, the administration of the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. That's it. That's so boring. That's not even entertaining. That's it. Are you sure? Well, the confession continues. Although fewer in number, so there's a lot less of them, and administered with more simplicity and less outward glory, in them is held forth more fullness, evidence, and spiritual efficacy. There's more power in word, sacrament, and prayer than anything from the Old Covenant. Wow. Christ is present in the Word. Christ is present in the Holy Supper. What more do we need? There is power and fullness and efficacy in the ordinances that Christ has given to us. Remember when Jesus said in the Great Commission, I will be with you always to the end of the age. Now go do whatever you want to do. Remember when he said that? He didn't say that, did he? He said, I'll be with you to the end of the age. Now do these things. He didn't say make stuff up as you go along. He didn't say make sure you're entertained. I'll see you later. He didn't say keep doing the things that have already been fulfilled by my life and death and resurrection. Keep having temple services. Keep up the priesthood. Keep up the candles. Keep up the incest. Keep, keep incense, not incest. Keep, keep up the temple choir. Keep up the temple orchestra. Keep up the priestly garments. Keep doing all of that stuff. It's great. I fulfilled it. Therefore, keep it up. He didn't say that, did he? I am with you always to the end of the age. Teach them to observe all that I have commanded. His ordinances. Jesus fulfilled it, and so he said, do it this way. But it's so simple. Are you sure? Praise God. That's a good thing. The gospel, beloved, is simple. The word is simple. Praying is simple. Sprinkling with water is simple. Bread and wine are simple. This is how Christ is shown forth. This is how the substance of the covenant is given to his people. We gather, we hear. Regeneration, as we heard this morning, comes through hearing. Faith comes through hearing. We offer praise. We pray we receive the body and blood of Christ. We remember our baptism. Living in the new administration is so much better. Because Jesus is better. And Jesus is enough. He's better than the angels. He's better than Moses. He's better than Joshua. He's better than Abraham. He's better than the Levitical priesthood. He's, be he's better than Aaron. He's better than the old covenant because the one he mediates is better. He's better than all the types and shadows because he has fulfilled all of them. Jesus' sacrifice is better. His blood is better. His day of atonement on Calvary is better. Jesus is better. And guess what? The ordinances that he has given to us are also better. Because the covenant that he mediates through his ordinary means is better. We'll close with these words from the sermon to the Hebrews. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more? 
Well, the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our consciences from dead works to serve the living God. In other words, Jesus is better. Amen.